You're listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church, recorded at one of our worship services. Good morning, everyone. Okay. I shall be reading from first Philippians 1, 3 to 11. It reads, I thank my God in all remem- my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is the true words of the living God. Thanks be to God. Great. Good morning, everybody. It is a real privilege to be uh, here with you and to have spent some time with your elders. Uh, Grace City Church in Nagoya, they send their greetings. Uh, many of you here have come and visited us, and thank you for that. And those of you who haven't, we forgive you. Um, <laughs> if you've gone from Tokyo to Kyoto, or from Osaka to Tokyo, you've gone past Nagoya, okay? We are halfway between those two places. Um, I want to just say that uh, you have a real quality eldership in this church. I say that because I've had the privilege of spending some days with them, and The Bible calls us to pray for our leaders, but I just want to encourage you to give thanks as well for your elders in Redemption Hill Church, because you have quality elders here and appreciate them. All right, appreciate them. Um, Our text, Philippians, Paul's letter written from in prison or in confinement. A famous saying, scripture interprets scripture. In other words, we don't get to throw out the rest of the Bible and all the other letters just because we are coming to Paul's letter to the Philippians. One of the big ideas in the Bible from beginning to end is this differentiation between grace and between works. So if you bear with me, I will get to the text, but I just want to set, set the scene. The Bible, again and again, contrasts grace with works. So for example, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, again, another writing from Paul. He says, God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and his grace. Grace contrasted with works. Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 9. Again, Paul, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It's not a result of works, so that no one may boast We have grace contrasted with works. It's foundational to our understanding of everything that's written in Scripture. And the word works, let's unpack that just for a moment. It refers to all the ways we try to earn favor with God through our doing. Right? Now, I'm sure when you've all had your members interview here and been asked to give the gospel, you could give a very clear and good and strong definition of what that means to be saved through the gospel by grace, but how often do our hearts slip back into works? If I do X, God should do Y. 
It's my effort, my works, my obedience that somehow is gaining God's favor and God's goodness. See, that way of thinking, it's a transactional relationship, right? It's a conditional relationship. I keep my side of the relationship and God keeps his side of the relationship and we all live happily ever after. What about that word grace? What does that mean? God's unmerited kindness. We've just read that prayer of assurance together. It's all about God's unmerited kindness. It's a reminder week after week after week that God's love is unconditional. It's all about God giving us what we don't deserve, giving us what we haven't earned, giving us what we could never work for. Grace is a gift. It's not an obligation. Works is an obligation, and it's not a gift. This distinction is a distinction between burden and freedom. It's a distinction between despair and joy. It's a distinction between dead religion and living faith. And it's crucial if we're going to understand what Paul is writing in chapter 1 of Philippians. Because this is a real letter, right? Written to real people, people like you and me. He's writing from his confinement But he's already had a relationship with some of these people, so it's real, it's it's based in reality. But we know that not everything is perfect in this church. You know, Paul goes on to mention that there's a dispute later on in this letter between two women, and he, he encourages them to resolve that. He mentions in just a a few more verses that there are those who preach Christ, but they're they're doing it from envy and they're doing it from rivalry. Okay? Sounds like a pretty ordinary church to me. Thank goodness it's not perfect. Means I can listen. Three things that I want to look at with you today. Okay? Okay? I want to look at the gratitude that Paul expresses in this letter. Okay? This first chapter is, is full of gratitude. I want us to look at what this gratitude is rooted in. Where does Paul's gratitude come from? And then I want to look at how that affects our relationship with God and how it affects even our relationship with one another. So let's start with point number one, always the good place to start, the gratitude that Paul expresses. So this is a greeting in Paul's letter to the Philippians, and it's one of, I think, I think it's one of the most challenging sections of Paul's letter to the Philippians. I think if you don't get this right, you're going to really misunderstand the rest of the letter, okay? You can jump into all the things, the good things we're called to do, and you can just go there, but you need to know the posture. You need to know the attitude with which we do those things. So Philippians chapter 1 verse 3 says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. You, all those believers, the good and the bad in the Philippian church. So he's not thinking of just a few people, some of those that he remembers. He's thanking God for all he remembers about the believers in Philippi. Okay? Verse 4. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Okay, so when Paul prays for the believers in Philippi, it's joyful. Okay? We've got the good, the bad, and the ugly in the church, but his prayers are joyful. Philippians 7, verse 7. It is right for me to feel this way about you all. 
because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Each of these believers is dear to Paul. If that's not enough, he goes on in verse 8. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. So Paul's affection for these believers in Philippi, that's the good, the bad, and the ugly, it's, it's unconstrained. It's overflowing. So let's turn that back upon ourselves, and let me ask you, could you write a similar letter or a similar opening to your letter to this church? We'll just let that hang there for a moment, okay? I won't ask anyone to raise their hands. It's easy to identify one or two people within our church family who we resonate with and who we get on with particularly well. But that, that's not who Paul's writing to here. Okay? Paul isn't writing to, Paul is writing, sorry, to all the saints in Christ who are in Philippi. So he's, he's not only writing to the believers who love him back the way he wants to be loved. Maybe there are believers, brothers and sisters who you don't quite yearn for, okay? Maybe yearn for is a little bit of an uncomfortable language when you think about this person or you cross paths with this person. Maybe there are believers that you kind of well just put up with. You know, they're there on a Sunday, I smile, I tell them what I had for breakfast, and then we go home. Maybe they don't love you the way you believe you should be loved. Maybe you've had a conflict and you no longer relate well. Maybe there are people in your life you no longer pray for with joy. In fact, your prayers are, God, change them. God, change them. Where's the joy? We might talk about the gospel changing everything, but how is the gospel impacting the way we relate to one another? What would it take for you to write a letter to one another as Paul wrote this letter? I thank my God every time I remember you. Every time I pray for you, I pray with joy. I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. What's it going to take to do that? When a church exercises that kind of love, the city notices. Yeah? When we have this kind of community, this kind of affection, when we have this kind of safety, That's something the world cannot find. It's something we have here. When Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you. Every time I pray for you, I pray with joy. I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. What's he doing? He's expressing gratitude. Okay, folks, I'm not suggesting this is easy. Okay, It's easy for me to express my gratitude to my wife on a good day. Okay? On a Friday night, I check what we're going to do as a family on a Saturday. Okay, and she'll tell me we're going to get up at this time and we're going to go and do some shopping. Then we're going to go to the onsen and relax. And great, I sleep like a baby because I know what's going to happen. I wake up in the morning and the plans have all changed. Okay? Okay? I've gone from a sleeping baby to a grumpy old bear. In those moments, can I thank my God every time I remember my wife? Can I pray for my wife with joy? Can, do I yearn for her in that moment with all the affection of Christ Jesus? Hmm. Hmm. You see, even the world loves those who love them back the way they want to be loved, right? But doesn't Christ call us to even love our enemies, to even love those who hurt us, 
to love those who are different from us? How do we get to this place of gratitude that Paul is talking about in his opening to his letter to the Philippians? Point number two, what's Paul's gratitude rooted in? What's behind this gratitude? Back to verses three to five. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. The gospel was, has created this partnership, this fellowship between Paul and these believers in Philippi. Have you ever visited a church in another city? It's like me coming here. And you find people who love the gospel. They celebrate the same truth that you celebrate. And you sit there like I've sat here this morning and you feel, oh, these people are my people. Welcome home. The gospel is a partnership. Um, a guy much cleverer than me, Marcus Brockmile, he says the term gospel designates both the message of redemption of Christ and God's power at work in the proclamation of that message. Let me just rephrase that, unpack that slightly, okay? In other words, our partnership in the gospel, next slide, is to share a love for the message, that's the truth of the gospel, and also to share love for how that message changes people. It's living. It's active. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone that believes. Okay? As the message of the gospel is proclaimed, it does something to the people it is being proclaimed to. So the question we ask ourselves is, why does it do something? Why does it have power? Why does God's power go out through the gospel? Okay, so look with me. Look with me at the next verse because the next verse contains one of the core verses, I think, in Philippians. Verse six, and it says, and I am sure of this. This is Paul talking to those people that he's expressing all that gratitude for. And he says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. <sighs> Relax. God began a good work in you and God will bring that good work to completion. So the gospel is not a message about you doing X so that God will do Y. The gospel is the good news that God started something in you and God will finish what he started. Now, I know scripture says work out your salvation, okay? So there's something for us to do, all right? I'm not saying this is passive, but behind that, the safety, the security, the place of rest is God will finish what he started in you. From start to finish, the main character who is working is God. It's not always you changing you, but God changing you from the inside out through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we can, we can all change ourselves, yeah? I occasionally exercise. I occasionally diet. Okay? In an attempt to change myself. But all of that is from the outside in. Okay? Okay? It's all me doing to try and change here. Grace doesn't work from the outside in. Grace works from the inside out. Grace is God at work in you, and that work in you manifests itself in your outward actions and your behaviors. But look where, look where Paul's confidence. Paul's confidence is that the God who began working in you will finish working in you. Again, back to this guy, Marcus, this is what he says about this particular chapter. He says, Paul's confidence 
is not in the Christianity of the Christians, but in the godness of God. Let me say that one more time. Paul's confidence here in this chapter is not in the Christianity of the Christians, it is in the godness of God. If you're the one who begins a good work in you, then there's little confidence that it's going to get completed because I don't know how many things I've started and not finished. If God begins the good work in you and God always finishes what he starts, there's a lot of confidence that the work will get completed. Verse 5, Paul speaks about the first day. Verse 6, Paul speaks about the day of Jesus Christ. That's, that's intentional. Okay, The life of a believer is lived between these two dates. Bear with me and I'll tie all this up in a nice little ribbon at the end. Okay, The life of a believer is lived between these two dates. From the, the day God began a good work until the day that Jesus returns to bring his work to completion. And we live between those two dates. So who can remember their first day? The day when the grace of God came into your life. Think about that first day. The way the grace changed you. We're usually going along in our lives. Assuming that God, whatever our God might be, rewards people for doing the right thing. If I do X, God will do Y. If I do X, my life will turn out like this. We assume that if good things are happening in our life, we should get the credit because we've made the right choices. We assume that if bad things are happening in our life, then God, God should get the blame because he's failing to look after me. This is how our minds function without grace. We live in a transactional way, right? At some point, someone proclaims the message of the gospel. They share it, the good news with you, that before you did anything, whether what you did was good or bad, God sent his only son into the world as a free gift. Jesus willingly went to the cross. Jesus died in the place of sinners. Jesus rose again. Jesus didn't do that in response to anything that you had done, will do. It's purely out of the goodness of his own love. Your works didn't play any part in that, right? You cannot demand things from God because he already gave his son before you ever did anything. Your works cannot add to or subtract from what Jesus has done. Because he did it all without ever consulting you. He just did it for you. You hear that message of grace, which you didn't deserve, you didn't earn. And it's so radical that it does something inside of you. The gospel changes everything. It humbles you. It starts to soften you. And the way you relate to God changes And in faith, you accept this gift that God offers you. And now, all your attempts, all your attempts to earn God's favor, yeah? All those ways that you were living by, those foolish, ignorant ways, oh boy, they start to seem silly and stupid. That's the first day of your partnership in the gospel. It's possible, right, to go to church, to do all the right things and never really understand grace. Maybe you're hearing this message and today is your first day. Your first day of being in partnership with all these good people here. Maybe you're realizing slowly you've been trying to earn that grace instead of receive that grace. It's God who began a good work in you. It's God who will complete a good work in you. Paul carries on in verse 7. He says, it's right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you 
are all partakers with me of grace. So Paul is this kind of superstar Christian, right? He's probably done more for God than I'll ever do. He certainly planted more churches than me. Definitely baptized more believers than me. He's probably suffered more than me. But look how he talks about these believers in Philippi. He says, you are all partakers of grace with me. That's inclusive language. That's the language of the body, the language of the church. There's no special order when it comes to grace. It's the same grace for you, the same grace for you, the same grace for you, and the same grace for me. When we truly understand it, it leads to gratitude. It has to lead to gratitude. Anytime you look down on somebody, anytime you distance yourself from somebody, you're communicating to them that you are better than them, that they are somehow less than you. When you're driven by shame, and I come from a shame on a culture, right? You're communicating to people that I am worse than you, and you are better than me. Whenever you feel you're better than somebody else, or whenever you feel you are less than somebody else, you're making a comparison. And what are you making that comparison on? You're making that comparison on works and not on grace. I've achieved something you haven't. They've achieved something I haven't. But if we're all partakers of the same grace, then there's no longer anybody greater than or less than, nobody more deserving than. Grace destroys comparison. We're all lost people who've been found, right? We're all blind people who can now see. Paul wants us to read his words through grace-filled glasses. Next slide on the screen. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you because we're all partakers of the same grace. Do you get what he's saying here? In every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because we're all partakers of the same grace. I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus because we're all partakers of the same grace. If we get grace, comparison melts away. We should be able to speak about other believers as affectionately as Paul does because we're all partakers of the same grace. So let's bring this home. Let's make this real. Who are the Christians in your life who you tend to avoid? Who in this family, in this body, do you compare yourself to? Which of your relationships lack gratitude? and lack joy. Jesus invites us this morning to let go of our scorecards, to be humbled by grace, and to fill our hearts with gratitude for what he's doing amongst us. My final point, I'll make it short. How does this affect our relationship with God? Verses nine to 11, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. How can you be pure and blameless for the day of Christ? How do you become filled with the fruit of righteousness? Paul says these things happen as your love abounds more and more. The more you are consumed with a love for God, a gratitude for grace, the more it changes the way we live our life. It's a love for God which leads to righteousness and obedience. It's a gratitude that awakens 
this love. Romans 4, sorry, Romans 2, chapter 4. Just to support this, it says, or do you presume? Okay. Or do you presume? That's my question to you. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Do you take God's kindness for granted? Are you lacking in gratitude because you're taking grace for granted? Next slide. If I've lost you, if you've fallen asleep, come back and just remember this slide because this sums up the message. All right? This is all you need to write down, okay, to be able to look as if you were listening in small groups, okay? You ready? Grace leads to gratitude. Gratitude leads to love, and it's love that leads to freedom, joy, and obedience. Ask yourself this question, why do you, why do you obey God? The works answer is I obey God so that God will favor me. I do all my good things to you so that you will favor me. The gospel answer is I obey God because I love God. I obey God in loving you because I love what God has done for me. One of these obediences is driven by selfishness. It's just flowing from a a sense of entitlement and duty. The other is an obedience driven by love and gratitude. It's full of grace and hope. From the outside, both look like obedience, but on the inside, the motivation is completely different. Paul's letter to the Philippians is about God's grace to God's people. It's more than a list of works that you have to go and manufacture. In God's church, we embrace a deep sense of gratitude for him and for one another. And our gratitude comes from an understanding that we are all partakers of the same grace. Let me finish with this. Anybody who has ever received an email, a text, or a letter from me, I sign my letters with grace and gratitude. Okay. I do it on purpose because I'm a guy who likes to get jobs done. I love working. I love action. I love ticking off my list. Okay? The problem is, as I tick off my list, I forget that stuff. Okay? So my texts and my emails and my letters can very easily be, do this, do this, do this, do this. Thank you very much. I don't have an automatic uh, ending. You know how you can set on your emails? You have the, the automatic ending. I type it out myself every time. And I send about 20 or 30 emails a day, just so you know with grace and with gratitude. And I look through that email, whatever it might be, however mundane it might be, and I check I'm doing it with grace. That this person I'm writing to is a partaker in the same grace as me. And then I write with grace and with gratitude. Okay, grace and truth come together, so it's not that I don't say truth. It's not that I pretend. It's not that I put on an outside face. It's not that I do as the British do, a stiff upper lip, okay? I can speak my truth, but I can do it with grace, and I can do it with gratitude. What am I grateful for in this person that I'm writing to? I want to encourage you to leave here today and do the same. Build grace Build gratitude into this body. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for beginning a good work in each of us in this room. I thank you for the promise that you will bring each work that you've begun in each of our lives, that you will bring it to completion. I thank you for the radical grace which you have made available to us and which we partake together as a church family. We just invite you through your Holy Spirit 
to humble us by your grace. We invite you to stir up within us a, a deeper sense of gratitude towards you and towards one another. Help us to be a people who are motivated and moved by grace. Help us not just to receive it for ourselves and to do nothing with it, but Lord, help us to build it again and again into this body. We come empty-handed this morning, acknowledging that even our good deeds fall short of your glory. We come knowing that not one of us is worthy to earn your favor. No work is good enough, except for the work that your son, Jesus Christ, did upon the cross. And Lord, we thank you for it. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You've been listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church. You can find more of our sermons online at www.rhc.org.sg.